Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to Sweetwater's Guitars and Gear. We have a special guest with us today. Eric Gales is here. Hey, man. Great How to you see doing, you. Man? Glad to be here, man. Appreciate you taking time out of your uh, schedule. I know you're gigging here in uh, Fort Wayne tonight. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited about it. I'm actually most excited right now about being here at Sweetwater headquarters. Well, man. we're excited to have you here, yeah, too. Yeah, man. So. Thank you. Very cool. Thank so you've been out with uh, Beth Hart, but mm -hmm. you're headlining tonight. I am. And then you're uh, you're off all over the world, aren't you? Man, all over the place, man. Uh, uh, you know, things are going really good. And, uh, this new record, Middle of the Road, is, is taking off really, really well. And uh, we've been out uh, pushing it as well as the previous other 15 albums that I've right. had the blessing to uh, be able to put out since uh, 91. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's just, you know, really an honor and a privilege to have an expression to be able to do what I love to do and um, travel around the world and with a great team and, uh, you know, just inspire. Right, right. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So it's, it's interesting. I, I have interviewed a lot of artists here, mm -hmm. but I think you probably hold the crown for the most musical family that you come from. I mean, I've, I've talked to people with their, their parents were into music, right. whatever, but, but right. like your grandfather played with Howlin' Wolf yes, and sir. Muddy Waters yes, and, and brothers and cousins. Yes, sir. Tell us a little bit about you that. you got the whole story. I mean, you, you've done your homework very well. Um, the, yeah, my grandfather, way long before I was even thought about coming in the world, my grandfather, uh, you know, he was uh, an, uh, uh, a deep, devout, uh, sanctified church preacher, uh, as well as his wife, my grandmother, she was an evangelist. And, uh, you know, the whole story goes down to that is uh, your early, old-timey church people really uh, were very um, uh, serious about not uh, mixing and blending what they call worldly music, you know, and mm -hmm. Christian music, you know, and then really allow too much worldly music in the house. So the whole thing about my grandfather playing with Howlin' Wolf was that there's nothing that he would have caught, had himself caught on record with Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters because that was worldly music and this guy was, in the, was a preacher and they were very serious about that as I spoke. Right. But they would get together and jam, you know, but that to, to, to the date that I know of, there's nothing on record. Mm -hmm. They just would sit around and jam. You right. know what I mean? Because if you look at old traditional gospel and old traditional blues, music-wise, they're the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. The only difference is one has rig uh, religious words, the other has quote-unquote right. worldly words. Right. But it goes back to that and, you know, uncles and, and aunties and nephews and cousins and, you know, uh, all across the board. My brothers, older brothers, and, uh, you know, my oldest brother was very instrumental in... Um, you know, being an introduction to music and uh, myself, uh, my mother and father uh, had us, you know, grow up in church, where I think, which I think is very, very prominent in the makeup and, and genetic build musically of who I am. And, uh, you know, I just through the course of the years of growing up, uh, threw some more spices in there sure. and created a nice pot of gumbo, you know, that uh, has uh, rounded off to be a whole lot of different things that I like and try to interweave them throughout the course of a 90 minute set or a two hour show that takes the listener on a on a trip that uh, may stop in several places, you know, but they all have a, a bond and um, kinship to the that, that the inspiration and the passion that comes from every note played is uh, it, it comes from a heart of uh, strong emotion <clears throat> and uh, a mind that remembers a lot of things that I've been through in life, you know what I mean? Sure. And, and a lot of it I have to admit was self-induced, but uh, having this new leash on life, you know, right now I'm almost 15 months clean and sober and that's nice. uh, a beautiful thing nice. uh, for those that knew me before, you know what I mean? So, you know, a lot of times that I was a half a breath away from being dead, you know? Right. So now I have this new leash and uh, it's going wonderful, it's going great. And, uh, you know, I can say I'm definitely back. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And we're glad, man. We're yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, thank you. So it's interesting listening to your music. You, you mentioned the kind of gumbo of things you put together. Mm -hmm. it, it's uh, You go far beyond what most blues or blues rocks players would, you know, I'll hear a, a country influence here. Then uh -huh. I'll hear some some jazz chords where you're going up and down the neck where it's almost a Joe Pass kind of a lick uh -huh. that they're throwing in there, some octaves True. and things. Man, were you, you listening it. to all those different kinds of music or were you, I was. where did you pick those up? I was. Actually, my brother Eugene, at four or five years old, he would be playing like uh, Vanilla Fudge and Blue Cheer and Fog Hat and, and, and Spirit and, and, and uh, uh, Zeppelin and Jeff Beck and Hendrix and Clapton, you know, this was at four or five years old, you know what I mean? Right. Topped it off with, you know, the whole experience of the gospel that I was telling you about because moms had us at church every Sunday and then throughout the week as well. So you take those and that's in the pot with the 
classic rock and all that stuff. Plus, my brother was hipping me on to like Wes Montgomery and 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 and, and um, um, Herb Ellis and. Uh, and then on top of that, he was turning me on to Jerry Reed and, and Roy Clark and, <laughs> and, 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 and all, uh, Danny Gatton and Albert Lee and all of these other cats. And at the same time, he was turning me on to Albert King and, and Muddy Waters and, and all of these different cats. And then I was listening to the music of my era, which was hip hop and R&B, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So you got all of that fusion. So, and then I'm listening to Eric Johnson and Stevie Ray and Robin Trower and Frank Marino. You throw all, all right. of that in there, so there's no way that I could not incorporate the things that were so influential on me mm -hmm. as a guitar player and as a music lover, period. Right. You know, those things, I mean, I, I like hip hop, I like blues, I like gospel, I like jazz, I like funk, I like classical, I like it all. So some kind of way in the live show that I have pre present now, it's a corporation and a fusement of all of that that makes the listeners say, wow, man, I just seemed like I changed the radio station yeah. several different times in the course of the show, but it all made sense. In the course of a solo sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, which is it's, awesome. Which yeah, is awesome. Man. Two of those uh, influences that you mentioned there, you've, you've mentioned before, I find very interesting. One is Robin Trower, uh, because most players would point more directly to Hendrix. True. But, but Trower, of course, is, is there. And uh, Frank Marino is yes, another sir. one that's yes, just kind sir. of an interesting one. You don't hear it come up a lot, but what a great player. You know, I'm going to tell you this, and I say this a lot and uh, in, in, uh, oftentimes in, in um, interviews that I do, you know, Let's just lay it on the wood. Hendrix is one of the it is one, if not the top. Why the reason I can't say the top is because Hendrix got people that he got stuff from. Sure. Which was like Abra King and Buddy Guy and Curtis Mayfield and you know and Muddy Waters and he just take took it and made it amped up blues. That's mm -hmm. basically what it was. So you got Hendrix. Hendrix created a morphosis, if that's a word. He created a morphosis that branched the tree off to several different branches and leaves and and, 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 and plants and things like that. Let's not get that twisted. Let me I wanted to put that on the wood. Sure. But to be honest with you, and this takes nothing away from him, this actually adds more elevation to how his contribution to the evolution of guitar was I'm more influenced by people that were influenced mm -hmm. by Jimi Hendrix more so sure. than I am influenced by directly mm -hmm. Jimi Hendrix mm -hmm. so that lets you know how much of an invasion that Hendrix had on other players that had them influencing people that points directly back to him so you know, and, and, and if he, I believe if he was alive, he would tell you that, man, it just came from me listening to people that I was liking at the time. You right. know what I mean? Right. Such as the people that I named. So right. it all goes to, you know, it's it's how it properly should be, you know, the, the evolution should go. You know what I mean? You know, one's supposed to inspire the next. The next supposed to inspire the next. And what's supposed to happen, in my opinion, is you take who you were influenced by in some kind of way, there's no way you can't take who you were influenced by and not captivate who they were influenced by because it's rolled up into that too. You right. know what I mean? So right. it's just a trickle effect. So by the time it gets to you, you, the newer generation should have a whole room full of people that, right. you know what I mean, right. at the end of the day. Now you go back in time, their influences were even less than what it is that we have nowadays. Right. You know what I mean? So. That's how I think that it's positively supposed to evolve. You know, mm -hmm. you take how somebody inspire, inspired you and you present that in the way that it moves you. You know what I mean? And uh, that's how I do it. You know, it's, nowadays I, I may do a, a rendition of uh, Voodoo Child or Little Wings or something like that. And I, you know, don't do it exactly the way that, mm -hmm. you know, I think that the right interpretation and the right in exp expression is doing something the way that you feel that it moves you to do. You know what I mean? Right. Why buy, why go and buy an imitation where you can go a few rows down in Sweetwater and buy the real thing? Sure. There you go. And, and, you know, and what I mean by that, right. why right. do that when you can go in the record store? And by here is the real Jimi Hendrix right here. Mm -hmm. Why well, I'm gonna buy an invitation? And what I mean by invitation of why do a cover of a song exactly the way that it was? Show how it inspired you and put you on top of it. That's what is how it should be. Right. That's just my opinion. Yeah, sure. No, I, yeah. I, I agree with you. It's kind of like a funnel, right? Exactly. Lots goes in the top, and you come out the bottom. That, that's it. Right, that's right, it. Right. That's it. It's interesting watching you play. Uh, uh, 
I want to talk a little bit about your left-handed versus right-handed uh -huh. orientation. But before we get there, a lot of the blues players, the guys that come out of the blues tradition, tend to be box players. They have that pentatonic box they work True. on. You work much more up and down the neck than a lot of those players mm -hmm. do. What led you in that direction? Eric Johnson. Huh, interesting. Just, you know, to Eric Johnson prior to him, Frank Marino. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Uh, just, you know, uh, when I was exposed to Eric Johnson as a player, period, way before... I and me and him begin to be really good friends. It's like one of my best friends now. So uh, never would I would have thought I'd had a relationship with somebody that moved me so. Right. And uh, but uh, you know I begin to get engulfed with a lot of of the technical, um, and not saying that it's all in the technical, but that captivated me of what made sense of how you can play a riff in one place and it just makes it, if it's at ease for you to already be able to move to the, and then you can link to the next spot. He explained that very well in his previous, early in the 90s hot mix videos that he did sure. back then. Dude, I had that on repeat for months, <laughs> for years. <laughs> right. And I soaked that in, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And you know, I've, I've, I still, be, I still, you know, soak in a lot of things and not only him, I mean, you got, you know, that same, process happened with me with Trower with 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 Stevie Ray with uh, Jeff Healy with uh, Frank Marino uh, Wes Montgomery you know what I mean I went through my phases of wanting to sound and be just like them and then my brother said you know what little bro I really am appreciative of you wanting to sound exactly like the people that you're influenced by but someday you got to take all of that and make it out of you Mm -hmm. You have to put you on top of it. And I never will forget that because it stuck with me all of my life. Now I got people saying to me, wow, the way that you morph all of these different things together, but I still hear you at the end right. of the day. You know what I mean? Uh, so <clears throat> that's kind of what I've took since I was a kid. And, and my brother told me that. And But uh, the, to be more precise to answer your question, Eric Johnson is one that, you know, kind of got me thinking outside of the box, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you know, you can get in a rut in the pentatonic box, you know what I mean? And you sure. know, if you just move down and go in the next spot, you have more area, you know, you can do one from up here and you can do the same riff here, but have more strings to go up a little bit more and weave it on down, it's just... Right. Yeah. Right, 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 absolutely. If that makes any sense. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah very clear. So as I mentioned, you're a, a right-hander. Yes, but yes. you play left-hand. You did, you did. I forgot all about that point. And there's the the uh, there's the aspect of your your uh, strong hand on the neck. But what really intrigues me is your picking hand. Yeah, for the longest I thought I was a a, a right-handed player because I thought what hand you label what you play by was the hand that did the most work. And for mm -hmm. me, this is the hand that does the most work. So for the longest as a kid, I thought I was right-handed. Right. So you know, by the time I figured out that it was quote unquote the wrong way, it was way too late. <laughs> I was comfortable and I was in there, right. not even realizing that man, I was still writing right-handed and at the whole the whole perplexed. A uh, 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 complexity of the whole thing didn't really hit me until later in life of, dude, I'm playing this bass backwards, and then I write, you know, so all you scientists out there and all you mad scientists that can put um, mathematical equation to labeling how it is that I play and help me figure it out, not that I'm going to change what I'm doing, but give me a scientific equation that puts together, you know, how I play, you know right, what I mean? Right. But it's just comfortable. It works for me. And, you know, I just never thought about it. Sometimes until somebody brings it up, it doesn't even dawn on me that I'm playing a way that everybody right. else, you know. Sure. It's not, it, it, it's, it's, it's more rare to mm -hmm. see a left-handed player upside down and backwards. Upside down is the, you know. and, and again, the, uh, looking at the, your right, your picking hand, mm -hmm. I want to say right hand, your, your picking hand, yeah. you do a lot of downstrokes even when you're coming up the strings. I do. Toward the higher strings. I do. And it's almost like a slip picking technique mm -hmm. is the way it kind of looks to me. It's very efficient. Did you work? Specifically on developing those kind of I things? I guess subliminally I did because it's to the point now I don't even think about it. It's like mm -hmm. it's, that is something that formed completely on its own. You mm -hmm. know, whatever style that you tell me that it is that I'm doing is what I listen to because otherwise I have no idea. It's just what's working for me. Sure. And, you know, it's a little bit of sweeping, a little up and down, a little bit of hybrid, a little bit of, you know, a little yeah. bit of all of that. You know what I mean? It's just whatever that works. But because you're upside down, for example, when you do the hybrid picking, normally a player would, the pick would be on the bass strings. And Fingers would. have been high, and you're reversed, right? Absolutely. And yeah, it's, it, the it, other way. it's a very different kind of a sound. It is. You it get is. a harder attack on the top strings. Yeah. You know, do you do you uh, consciously look at the way those things are tonally affecting what you're doing? Are you looking for colors as you're shifting between those things? I am. 
I am. And it, it happens so fast that the wherever my mind is sitting for the particular tone around this that I'm looking for, it just automatically sends a message to my hand and I'm not paying attention to what it's doing. It's just doing it. You know what I mean? Right. And I, I hope that that gives you a proper answer for sure. that because like I have no particular technique that I sat and that I call myself working on or whatever. It's just, man, okay, I figured this out is this is how I got to hold my hand to do this to make this sound come out. And that's how it wind up happening. Sure. You know what I mean? If that turns into some sort of um, process that, you know, you uh, guitar, finger style player gurus can figure out what you call that then i'm open to all ears right. but it just came it came to light just trying to right. say hey this works so i'm gonna rock with this you know what mm -hmm. i mean yeah so yeah there's a lot of subtleties in the difference there for example when you play a power chord you're hitting the higher strings first rather than the lower strings first and those kind of things all make right. a, a subtle difference in creating your unique sound in your tone and you're right you're right and even when it comes to the right hand there's like you know i have not really realized at first but there's type of chords that i hit that are different from mm -hmm. you know i was gonna it, ask you about it, that. it's yeah. very <laughs> difficult because i do skype lessons online when i have the mm -hmm. time i'm very busy now but when i'm trying to show uh, a right-handed person um certain chords that I'm doing, it's virtually impossible for them to morph their hands the mm -hmm. way that I'm doing, which is very easy for me, you know what I mean? Right. But I have to say this, the majority of the stuff, I would say 90% of the stuff that I learned, uh, almost 99% of the stuff I learned was strictly by ear. And I was, you know, learning Eric Johnson, Stevie Ray, Robin Trower, Hendrix, all of this sort of stuff. So the majority of the stuff that I learned as a left-handed upside down player was from right-handed players. Mm -hmm. And I figured it out. Right. Just by grinding, scratching that record up, right. just grinding. So if I could do it, then that'd be my first thing that I tell them, man. Don't mm -hmm. let me playing upside down and backwards be an intimidation factor or I can't do it sort of thing. Because right. I learned pretty much everything that I'm doing from listening to right-handed players. I think that's a reason why we probably <clears throat> won't see anybody else doing that because today with YouTube, everything is so visual it versus is. being uh, oral, yeah. oral meaning ears. Yeah. You know, you, you uh, like you said, you learn by ear and all I this did. stuff, whereas today you watch and, and so it would be, I think it'd be harder to come up with a unique approach like that mm. uh, without having that isolation. That you, Man, you know what, uh, I, you, you make a very valid point. I think the time and era that I came up, I wouldn't trade it for the world, you know what I mean? It was some some hard, hard knocks ways of having to try to figure it out. And uh, you know what, it's just the drive of the inspiration overpowered any defeat. Mm -hmm. Like defeat was not an option. That wasn't happening. If it was the fact that I had to stay up all night because I was afraid that if I went to sleep, I was gonna forget what I learned the night before, then that's what I had to do. Right. That is, inspiration is very, very powerful, man. Sure. It makes learning not feel like homework. Right, right, right. So and the dedication there, it's too. very strong, man. Yeah. Very strong. Yeah. So you've been doing some interesting things lately. I, I, I uh, heard a, a <coughs> cut where you played uh, Layla with Derek Trucks. That I did, and that actually came out in early 2000, man. I was, was in my 20s. Uh, yeah, wow, I was okay. in my I'm, 20s. I'm behind the times. <laughs> yeah, I was, in my I was in my 20s at the time. I'm about to be 43. How about that? Yeah, oh my God. Oh, I didn't realize I, that was that long ago. That was when I first met Derek Trucks. And we were in the studios. I was like, man, who is this guy in there killing like that, dude? And he was a little younger than me. I think he's right around my age, not a little, a little, a little bit less. And that's when we first met. And what an introduction. Mm -hmm. It was crazy. Yeah. And then I found out me and this guy was being paired up together. And I was like, whoa, you got to be kidding me because this <laughs> guy's in there sounding like a grown man. Right. I said, wow. So. That was that was a beautiful occasion, man. Yeah, you, know? we, you both allowed each other plenty of space Absolutely. to kind of to kind of do what you do and to make your own statements and things, yeah. which was very cool. It wasn't a yeah. competitive thing. It didn't uh, sound no, like. Yeah, it. exactly. That was man. That was wild, man. I, I, just, I just had no idea I was going to the studio that day and going to encounter somebody like him, and it was a beautiful thing. This guy is an amazing, mm -hmm. amazing player. Do you find uh, as you go into I've, I've, I've seen some things where you've been sitting in with uh, Beth Hart's band and mm -hmm. different groups and, and different situations you've been playing in. Traditionally, you play in a, a power trio. I do. Do yeah. you find you, you and you do a lot to fill mm -hmm. to have a big guitar sound and keep uh -huh. things full? Do you have to 
modify what you're doing to fit in with a, a group that has more players? No, not really, man. I, you know, because I have been in settings of um, meshing with uh, d uh, different configurations that where it's uh, like secondary and it comes to be no problem. I just, you know, I, I try to fit in between the gaps. You know what I mean? I try to fit in the comfortable slot, you know, until they look at me and tell me to press the gas and do, you know, what I do, right. then there, there you have it. But until then, you know, I love playing rhythm, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I thrive off of it, you know, but a lot of my stuff is a lot of rhythm-based stuff, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, and uh, as of current, I have, you know, as of, you know, uh, November of last year, I have an addition of percussion and, you know, and, and before that I had background vocals, but I have in my setting, you know what I mean? I have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, um, and in addition to this power trio thing, uh, that element when people, before they hear it and they see that I have an addition of percussion and, and drum pad with sampling uh, with triggered vocals in there and different sounds, they're like, hmm, how does that go with a power trio? And but when right. they hear it put together, it's a fusion of, at the end of the day, it's like, wow, now I don't want to hear you without that. That's right. what they say, you know what I mean? Sure. So sure. Uh, it's like, man, I'm always looking at ways I can elevate and, you know, you know, incorporate things that I think to me that is like, wow, man, that sounds amazing. So if it, I know I don't have bad taste. So if, I think something sounds amazing to me, and I decide to add it in as an element to what I have going on. Yeah, power trio, yeah, that's what I've been known for, but it's especially with the, I wouldn't take and add a new element. I, it take me a while, but like from like my 91, 92 records that came out, that was like straight power trio. Like that was like, that deserves to be untouched. You know sure. what I mean? That right. is like raw. You know, but like more of the newer Eric Gale stuff that's happening, it's still power trio core bass, but mm -hmm. it has elements of very strong background vocals, you know, um, uh, some really strong tambourine driven, you know, shaker type stuff and, and ambient sort of added, you know, I like that, I, I really like that, you know, mm -hmm. to show where I've evolved from since 91, 92 through sure. up to now, you know what I mean? It's just, it's just, uh, it's just, you know, I don't know what this means, but right. you know what I'm trying you're, to say. You're growing. You've got you to keep growing and expanding right. what you do, right? Incorporate right. those things. Yes. Does that affect how you approach the soloing? Because obviously with a power trio, it's just the bass, and mm -hmm. so the harmonic background to what you're doing for your solos is coming from you True. as you're playing versus playing with a harmonic instrument, another rhythm player, uh, vocals behind you, whatever it might be. Uh-huh. You know what? It actually is more in, in, in the setting that I have it right now, it's more, it's even more... It was the best way to use it. It's even more of a prop. The prop meaning it, it, it's more of an inspirational push hmm. that's behind me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, even in my soloing, I can't help but to play rhythm while I'm soloing too. You know what I mean? This is right. how I've been, you know. And uh, within that, you know, there's a foundation that's behind me with, you know, the uh, with my wife hitting the the, the, the triggered uh, background vocals, or uh, uh, I would get her to have a triggered organ part or something like that in there that fits perfectly in the song that gives me this foundation behind me that takes me to a whole nother level of like it catapults me into another dimension that I'm not thinking about when it's not there, you know what I mean? Right. Which is beautiful. Like I come from the rhythm and it's stronger power and then like it's nothing goes anywhere. It's still there. It's it's hard to describe, man. It's you just have to Right. Yeah. You know. That's a foundation to grow off of, right? And it's beautiful, to, man. Yeah, it's beautiful. that's awesome. Yeah, that, man, that's, man, that's great. Beautiful. That's great. So I also saw, maybe I'm out of date on this too, but but uh, did you just play on a, a track for Bootsy Collins that's going to be I did, it's co I did, and I am so uh, elated and I'm excited to uh, have it uh, be, you know, to be a part of that, you know, and Bootsy and I connected from these Hendrix tours mm -hmm. that happened, and we've been buddies ever since, and uh, he hit me and said, Eric, I'd like you to be featured on one of my songs on this new record, and uh, ironically, we're label mates, actually, mm -hmm. through Mascot, and uh Man, all I can tell you is wait for it. When you hear it, it's got some serious funk on it, man. It's crazy. Right. And to have the opportunity to be with uh, a legend like Bootsy Collins is uh, all you guys get that record. I'm, I, I'm a little 
lost on the date, but if I'm not mistaken, it's October sometime that that record comes out and it has a boatload of major people on there and I'm very thankful to be a part of it. That's very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, man. man, congratulations on everything that's happening. Thank you got you, so man. much cool stuff going on. Great Thank tour you, going on for, yes, sir. for the, the coming months. Are you back in the studio then or are you working on a new man, album? Man, I just up? got uh, about a month ago, the president of the label said, Eric, you already know that I want to do another record with you. So uh, I got some really powerful, uh, the last record was great with having Gary Clark on sure. there with me and Lauren Hill producing a track and Rafael Sadiq being part of it and uh, you know uh, my wife and I singing full on background vocals on it and you know it was a massive you know effort to you know let a light shine of the new me and I think it was a start of a, a serious movement that um, if the world you know thought uh, really highly of middle of the road that came out in March. You just wait till this next one comes because I got right. some, some serious surprises happening right. for this new record. Something that I can't talk about That's awesome. at the moment, but it's going to be cataclysmic. Right, very exciting. Yes, yes, but till then, middle of the road is killing, man. It's, it's, it's rocking. So <laughs> thank you, man. Uh, right thank on. You, man. Great to see you. Thank you, man. Have a I great gig tonight. It. Thank you so and, much. And uh, thanks for all the great music. We appreciate. it. Thank you. I'm gonna All keep right. it rolling, man. And thanks for joining me for Sweetwater's guitars and gear. Be sure to tune in next time. We'll have more guitars, more amps, more effects. We'll be making lots of music. I'm Mitch Gallagher.